My name is Dorley and this is my husband Sam and we're so excited that you've chosen to join us for our online service this weekend. Yeah, if this is your first time checking out a Christian church, we're pretty ordinary people, at least I think we are, uh, but our lives have been truly impacted by the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and it's made a huge difference in our lives, and we want the same for you. And so my hope and prayer is that as we experience the songs and the lyrics, as you hear the teaching from the Bible, that you'd be built up, that you'd be encouraged and challenged in your journey of faith, wherever it is that you find yourself right now. And so in just a moment, we're gonna sing and worship together. But before we do, I just wanna make a note for any families watching yeah. that we do have a kids service that we've prepared for your kids. And there's crafts and activities that your kids can engage in. It's actually really fun for the whole family too, hey? Yeah, there's some cool Love cartoons, great songs and stretches you guys can do together. And so you can access it on our website or if you're watching on YouTube in the description of this video. Okay, well, why don't we take a moment to pray before we move into the rest of our service right now. Would you pray with me? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we, we acknowledge your presence with us now. And as we take this time now to sing, to, to bring our praise before you, I pray it would be a sweet sound of worship in your ears. And then as we hear your word preached, would you speak to us, we pray. Mm -hmm. we ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress You are my portion You are my hiding place I believe you are the way The truth The life I
Spirit fill me till my cup overflows. Light the path before me, show me where to go. I give you my heart and I give you my soul. Take my desire. Take all of me I'm yours to leave With all my heart I receive Lord, you dwell within me You give me strength for today Trust in your God never fail me and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able 
I'm thankful for your mercy I'm humbled by your love Thankful for the promise That you'll always be enough For all that you've done for me And all that is to come Thank you Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness that never stops pursuing us, never stops chasing after us. Thank you for your grace today, your mercies that are new today. And we just see your goodness in our lives, even in the midst of chaos and brokenness and hardship and pain and sorrow and change. You are constant. You never fail. And you are always good. So would you just help us see your goodness today? We just rest in your goodness. We rest on your promises. We love you, Lord. We say thank you, Jesus. We're so thankful for your goodness in our lives. Help us, give us eyes to see and ears to hear your goodness. It's so easy to get clouded by media and different things, but we just tune our eyes and our ears to just see and hear your goodness in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, this is a time in our service where we continue our worship, mm -hmm. positioning our hearts towards generosity. The Bible teaches us that where your treasure is or where you spend your money, there your heart is also. 
So as Christians, we give a portion of our income to God to advance his kingdom work on the earth. Yeah, that's good. This church has, is incredibly generous. Yeah. And one area of our church that I get to oversee and bring oversight to is, is our finances. And I have been blown away, especially through this COVID season, I just the faithfulness of God in the area of our finances and also just the consistency and faithful giving of our church family. Week after week, uh, we've been able to meet the physical, spiritual, emotional needs of people in our city, as well as overseas through our missions initiatives. So thanks so much. It's because of you and your faithfulness and your commitment to the mission of our church that we're able yeah. to do all those things. And so there's a number of different ways that you can give and they should show up on the screen below. Okay, there's also a number of different things that are going on in the life of our church that we want to highlight and, and bring to your attention. Firstly, there's community groups. Community groups is a pivotal part of our walk with Jesus and has been a huge part of my personal growth and formation. To be able to have people to encourage me in my faith or to have people to walk yeah. alongside me with my doubts and struggles has brought both healing and good challenges to my life. If the pandemic has reminded me of anything, it's that we have been created for friendship and intimacy. Mm -hmm. It's really difficult to do this life by ourselves, nor was it ever God's intention. So if you're not plugged in into a community group, I'd encourage you to join one. It might be awkward at first, but we encourage you to commit. There's so much fruit and beauty on the other side of that awkwardness. I also want to take a moment to highlight our Rail City campus. As long as restrictions lift, permitting us to physically gather, we're gearing up to launch Rail City campus in September of this year. And uh, we're so excited. We're only four months away. And I'm, I'm personally thrilled. We live in the city of Port Moody and we're really excited just to have a strong gospel outpost, a visible presence of the church in that city, a city that desperately needs Jesus. So there's a number of different ways that you could get involved if you want to. There's, there's quite a few people in our church who actually live in Port Moody. We see a lot of them walking around Rocky Point and even in our neighborhood. Um, and so if you live in Port Moody and you wanna get involved, why don't you go to our website and find out about this campus and see if maybe you could go and, and be part of that. Um, we know that there's some some people in our church who, who have even said, you know, maybe they go to town center or they go to Mariner, but they say, hey, you know what? I'd be willing to go for a year mm -hmm. to go and help launch this thing strong. And I might go back to Mariner or town center later, but we celebrate that. If you would help us to launch Port Moody strong, that would be fantastic. Um, another area that you could help if you want is uh, we're, we're, we need to raise some money in order to plant this well. And so our goal is to raise $200,000 and uh, Cam and the team have been doing a great job with that. We're about a quarter of the way there. We got four months to go. And so if you want to give, maybe you, you can't go or you, or you don't feel called to go and be part of it, but you could give financially, that'd be fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then the last thing I wanna say is about prayer. And this is the bedrock of all we do as a church. And so um, if you would join us in praying for our leaders of the campus, that'd be Cam and Jess Daly, as well as um, Paul and Robin Numrich and so many others uh, who, are, who are leading. Right now we have 48 kind of wow. volunteers, core cool. team who said, we're gonna go, we're gonna plant in the city. And I know there's gonna be dozens more in the coming months. But would you pray for that team as they begin to invite their neighbors into conversations about Jesus and begin to plan on what this campus is exactly gonna look like? We would covet your prayers for this. Yeah. All right, so at this point in the service, we're gonna move into our preaching segment. So I wanna encourage you to get your Bibles, a notepad, and really lean in as yeah. we hear God's word for us today. So let's just take a moment and pray before we jump into it. Jesus, um, we are open. Our ears are open and our hearts are open to you today. Mm -hmm. Will you speak to us? Will you um, soften our hearts to hear your word and you hear your truth today? Thank you for um, the things that you're gonna re reveal to us and thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. The Proverbs say that the power of life and death are in the tongue. Words are powerful. We ought to be careful with how we use them, but we often play fast and loose with our words, quick to speak, quick to criticize. We often speak flippantly, repeat questionable things we've heard others say without even giving it a second thought. And look where it's landed us. Partisan politics, he said, she said, fake news, conspiracy theorists run rampant. Even exchanging opposing ideas isn't easy anymore with, within your own family. Yeah. Especially on social media, you might get unfollowed. Worse, you might get canceled. 
I was recently watching Yellowstone, and there's a moment where Kevin Costner, who plays the ranch daddy, is explaining to his daughter why he's invested so much in her brother's career. And he says, lawyers are the swords of this century. Words are weapons now. I need you to learn how to use them. I thought that was so aptly put. (laughs) We've turned words into weapons now. Words are weapons, words that cut like a knife. It's a regrettable place to be, right? Can I tell you what I wish for us, for our church? I'll tell you what I want for you, for your family, for your neighbor. In a world where it's difficult to rely on media or have faith in government or or even trust our own circle, what our own circle of friends tells us, my hope for you is to become more and more every day, to become more a man, a woman of your word. I want you to be trustworthy. I want your words to be worthy of other people's trust. And I think, I think it has a lot to do with the words that we say and the words that we don't say. We have enough <laughs> provocative journalists. We have enough straight shooters. There's more than enough loud mouths, but what about quiet mouths? What about quiet strength? What about strong listeners? Instead of YouTube preachers chasing celebrity, what if Christians strive to be world-class listeners pursuing integrity? How would you characterize yourself? Are you slow to speak and quick to listen? Or quick to speak and slow to listen? Somewhere in between, maybe? Words are powerful, and we ought to be careful how we use them. We need to be careful, but being careful uh, in the way that we use them doesn't mean that we're coward-like and not saying what we should. It, It means being caring, being loving, and sometimes it means speaking even when we don't want to. We ought to be caring with our words, especially in our relationships, in our family, in the relationships closest to you. The words that you say can tranquilize rage, take rage out of somebody. You can cultivate peace. You can fortify the timid. You can fortify those who are scared. The words that you say are powerful. The words that you say can also unmake relationships, divide family, and kill the spirit of another. There's a lot of power in our words, and this power comes from God. It was by words that God created everything, and by his word, he holds it all together. So how, how should we use this power? How should we use our words? In the scriptures, we can find help. Where we have erred, where we have spoken, where we have, where we have spoken hate, where we have gossiped, where we've slandered, where we've damaged the spirit of other people, we can find help and a way forward in the scriptures. There's, there's a path to healthy Christian living. There's strong wisdom in here, and it will help guide us into all truth. So if you have a Bible, would you turn with me to the book of 1 Peter in chapter 3? Uh, we're going to start in verse 8. Admittedly, there's, there's a lot of places in Scripture that talk about, that teach about speech and the way that we use our words. But I think the letter of 1 Peter has special relevance to us in our moment. Peter was a first century Christian pastor, one of Jesus' closest friends, a disciple, a leader of leaders. And this is more of an aside, but I think Peter's an interesting case study because the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, seem to characterize him as a talk first, think later kind of guy. I don't know, do you know anybody like that? It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission. Stop talking, let's just do something. Verbal processors. Well, you're in good company if you do. Given the choice between brainstorming or storming in on someone, I think Peter at least a young Peter, would have much preferred action over words. But when Peter wrote this letter, it was quite late in his life. A more simmered down Peter. A Peter who's learned to listen strong, to think well, and to speak life. And so if it helps you to not simply read past this and treat this like some sort of religious story, try imagining Peter, and and probably a scribe, in a quaint Roman villa on a balcony, writing this letter uh, to some new believers in faith. So this this is God's word for you today. Finally, 
All of you, be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. Because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. This is the word of God. It's absolutely true and it's given to us in love. The Christians who first read this letter had recently come to faith in Jesus and were dealing with all sorts of hangovers from their former lives. Bad habits, toxic relationships, unhealthy cultural values like pleasure-seeking, subjugation of others, and revenge. And when when scholars uh, talk about Peter's audience, they use the word Gentile to describe them. But the parallels to our own culture are remarkable. Think about it for a moment. Would you characterize our world as pleasure-centered or entertainment-centered? Does it make you angry at all when you see the subjugation of others or when people step on others to get ahead or when when somebody gets used? Are there examples of revenge justice in our culture? If you think so, you would do well to go a little deeper into 1 Peter and discover more about how Christians ought to live in times like these. Actually, I think Pastor David is teaching a class on 1 Peter right now, and I know the material will be made available later if you're interested in that. The intended message of this scripture is to live a godly life. But for some reason, in the end, in verse, starting in verse 10, the author points to the way that we use our words. So Peter is guiding us to live a godly life or to imitate Jesus, and he essentially says, here's how you ought to act. First, towards those in your church community, and then second, to all those outside your church community. But then in verse 10, he quotes Psalm 34, which connects the godliness of our life to the godliness of our speech. Okay, so the church, first things first. How should Christians relate to others in the church? It says right away in verse 8 that we should ensure that you're sympathetic toward others' needs, tender and love toward others, and maintain a sober self-assessment. Okay, look with me at verse 8. Have unity of mind and sympathy and brotherly love and a tender heart and a humble mind. We've got to be sympathetic of needs and tender-hearted and humble-minded. I think these are pretty straightforward, and they make a lot of sense. But I want to talk a little bit about humble-mindedness. Being humble in mind means you don't have too high a view of yourself or too low a view view of yourself. You have a sober view of yourself. You're not too high. You're not too low. You have a sober view of yourself. In other words, if pride is the opposite of humility and pride is living outside of what God says about your identity— then being humble or being sober-minded means moving into what God says about your identity, about who God says you are as his son and daughter in Jesus Christ. But I think for us, this is where the breakdowns start, where the engines of our lives have critical failures. We live outside what God says about our identity. We're prideful. To be sure, most of us are dealing with inferiority pride, like bad self-talk, or low self-esteem, but that's still pride. It's still outside of who God says that you are. It's still still prideful, and we have to make that mind shift into what God says about our identity, and this is where we can really help each other out. I think this is what Peter's referring to, where we're sympathetic and we're tenderhearted. You have so much power as you speak life into another person. Good words spoken at the right moment can heal hearts that have been made broken. You can help cultivate a sober self-understanding for others. Tell them what you see. Tell them what they maybe can't see. Speak life into others. Be caring. But remember, being caring doesn't mean being coward-like. It doesn't mean we don't say the hard things. 
It means that when we do that, we do it sympathetically and lovingly. You have so much power as you speak into another person's life. In this church and in this community, ask yourself, how could I be sympathetic to the needs of my own wife or, or my own husband? How could I be sympathetic toward them? How could I be tenderhearted toward my parents? What's something that I could say to them or to my children? What's some, how could I show my tender heart towards them? How is God guiding me to speak life, edification, encouragement to my, my sister or my brother? Well, like Jesus said, those who do the will of my father are my sisters and my brothers. To my immediate community, how can I build up these people around me? Have, have you noticed anybody in your life that has too low a view of themselves? What words could you say that would build them up in love? What, what old man Peter is helping us understand is what it means to live a godly life, to imitate Christ. And in verse 8, he deals with the church. And in verse 9, he deals with those not yet a part of the church community. We don't want to think too uh, fantasy about what Rome was. First century Rome was not a nice place to be. Uh, the evil and, and really unchristian cultural values of pleasure-centered living and subjugation of others and like revenge justice were normative. Peter, who was crucified upside down, knew that firsthand. So in the face of a culture like that, what kind of living does he call the church to? What kind of living does he call the church to in a culture that is unchristian by nature? He calls it to eschatological living. That's what. Es eschatological. So eschatology is the study of theology of the last things or the end of the world as we know it. And Peter is calling the church in the face of an unchristian culture to live with the end in mind. What you may or may not know is how much Peter talks about suffering in the book of First Peter. In just five short chapters, he uses the word suffering or pathema 16 times. Compare that with the 14 times we see the word rejoice in Philippians, and you start to get an idea of the tone of Peter's content. The message that he is saying is that you will face suffering, but this is not the end. This is not the end. Live with the end in mind live with the end in mind. He's writing to new believers in Jesus who are facing a lot of opposition from those outside the church. The unchristian values of binging, of self-promotion, of getting even, flying right in the face of those trying to imitate and be like Jesus, flying right into their relationships, into their own actions. It was difficult and it was hard, but they had hope. But they had, it was difficult and it was hard, but they had hope. Look again at verse 9 in chapter, chapter 3, verse 9. It says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. That you may obtain a blessing. Peter is pointing to the great reward of faithful living, living with the end in mind, the new life that they were given, a life with God forever. It's almost as if he's saying, think of the gracious way that God has dealt with you. Think for a moment what lies beyond these present difficulties. In fact, think of Jesus, who for the joy that was set before him, endured all sorts of humiliation, even to the point of the cross. In light of what God has done, don't you think you could extend the same grace to the undeserving? to those who's, who have reviled you, to those who have criticized you. Couldn't you bless? So we live with the end in mind. This present evil doesn't need to be repaid by you. You don't need to revile, criticize, and abuse others the way that they've hurt you because with your words, you can bless. With your words, you can bless. And wow, that is a difficult word. Bless my persecutors. Bless my, bless my oppressors. Bless those that have hurt me. How are we able to do that? How are we able to bless those who have persecuted us? We can see in the Gospels how Jesus teaches through this, but it's to the degree that you have experienced the forgiveness of God that you're able to be like God. Or as Jesus put it, right? The one who has been forgiven much loves much. 
It is a blessing to forgive. And when we do this, we're actually partnering with Christ in his work and what he came to do in the ministry of reconciliation. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, in verse 14, Scripture shows us how we get to partner with Jesus in his mission. And this is what it says. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died, and he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one. We regard no one from a worldly point of view. There are no little people. Though we, were once, though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And it was with Christ's words from the cross that he reconciled the world to God, right? Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. It is finished. And it was finished on the cross. And this is how we are able to bless those who revile us those who criticize us, those who, who slander us, those who gossip about us. It's because as we experience God's forgiveness of our own sin, of our own toxicity, our own evil speech, it is as we confess our sins where we've missed it, we grow in our capacity to forgive others of their sins. That's how we're able to do it. John Owen, who's a 17th century theologian and a good friend of John Bunyan's, prolific writer in theology, often spoke about the Christian life as the practice between mortification and vivification. We mortify and we vivify by our words. Mortify means to put something to death. And vivify means to bring something to life. In Colossians 3, verse 5, it says, Put to death, mortify, put to death, therefore, what belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, filthy language from your lips. Don't lie to each other. You've taken off your old self and its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of its creator." <clears throat> Verse 12, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, this is the vivify part, clothe yourselves with passion, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. And over all these things, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. And this is how we live a godly life in the church and outside the church community. We mortify the sin in our life. We put to death, therefore, the sin in our life. And we vivify the goodness in others. <laughs> we speak life to others. There's a lot of power in your words. You can tranquilize the rage in somebody's life. You can calm them. You can cultivate peace. You can fortify people when they don't have courage. The words that you say can help build up people and the words that you say can unmake relationships, divide families, and kill the spirit. Let's look at the last verse in our passage today, starting in verse 10. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. Peter is quoting Psalm 34 here, and he's showing us that our words are related to our godliness of our lifestyle. Our words are mirrors of our souls. What he isn't saying is, you know, you slander once and you're done. He's saying, your word is a mirror to your soul. 
keep vigilant, stay vigilant, keep at it. And when you make a misstep, and you sound more like the world and less like God, address the breakdown behind your words. Ask yourself, what's really going on within me? And then pray to the God of heaven and he will hear your prayer. Address the, the toxic behavior before God and ask him to help you experience his forgiveness of your sin. It's as Jesus said, right? Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our words are powerful. They can kill They can create and they can reveal. How are you using your words? What will you speak to others today? Let me pray for you. Father, today we come, we thank you for what Jesus has done on the cross. We thank you that in him, we are made a new creation. That today you can renew us, Lord, by your spirit. You can help us to walk in your ways, to imitate Christ in our speech, that we can love others, that we can build up others in love. Lord, we thank you for the power of words. God, we thank you for giving us an ability to to bless others. Lord, we pray for courage there. God, we pray for a, a new revealing of your forgiveness of our own lives. Help us, Father, to live as you would have us live. Help us to speak as you would have us speak. Help us to go into this week and bless the world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. As we draw to the end of our service, I just wanna point out a few possible next steps for you in your journey with Jesus. First, maybe this is your first time hearing about this Jesus we've Mm. talked about today, and you have questions. And if that's you, please don't hesitate to reach out. We wanna hear your questions. And if you wanna talk about it too, we're available to do that as well. And if you're in a place where you want to accept Jesus into your life, please let us know. Mm. We wanna celebrate with you and help resource you in any way that we can. We don't want you to go through this alone. There's a lot to celebrate if you accepted Jesus into your life, and we'd be honored to be one of those people who celebrates with you. Yeah, so good. If you're watching one of our interactive services, you can hit the prayer button, and one of our pastors, even right now in this moment, would love to pray with you either in the chat or they can give you a phone call and you can pray over the phone. Okay, maybe you have given your life to Jesus in the past, but you haven't been baptized. And I would say, why? what better time than right now to, to, to choose to get baptized and to take that step of obedience in your relationship with Jesus. And so if you'd like to pursue that, again, go to our website, go to chchurch.info and fill out the really basic form. And we would love to get in touch and find out when we can get you baptized. Okay, at this point in our service, we are gonna put some questions on the screen and we'd love for you to take some moments just to ponder, maybe to journal, uh, discuss with those around you. If you're watching uh, one of our interactive services, don't rush off, maybe discuss in the online chat right there, discuss the discussion questions. And uh, otherwise, we love you, church. We're praying for you regularly. We're family, we love you so much. Talk soon, bye-bye. Bye.